Hi, I'm Nancy Florine, at-large member of the Montgomery County Council, inviting you to join me for a conversation with Sharon Bova, Chair of the Board of Supervisors for Fairfax County. That's coming up next, right here on County Cable Montgomery. The Irish Inn at Glen Echo sets the stage for the Snow Boundaries. Thanks for coming. Where two local leaders met to discuss issues and share common concerns. Good morning, the Irish Inn. Can I help you? While staff prepared for the lunch crowd, Nancy Florine, at large member of the Montgomery County Council, welcomed the chair of Fairfax County's Board of Supervisors, Sharon Bolivar. Sharon, thanks so much for coming across the river to Montgomery County. How is the traffic? It's, the traffic is <laughs> always challenging, but uh, it's my pleasure to have a chance to sit here and, uh, and chat with you and uh, get to know you a little bit better. And, and I always enjoy actually coming into Maryland. It actually was my hometown. Really? Well, we're here at the Irish Inn, about the closest place we could find where we could have a cup of coffee and, and visit and be very close to the Beltway. Uh, my traffic ride was not too bad this morning, which I was shocked by, so there is hope maybe for congestion in the Washington region. There is hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good for us to uh, talk like this. Uh, we've spent some time together down at the Council of Governments. Um, you've been on the Board of Supervisors now for... I've just completed my 24th year in office, so I'm beginning uh, my, uh, let's say, so that would be my seventh term, and, uh, but, but this is my first full term as chairman of the Board of Supervisors. For the past three years, I've been filling the term of, uh, that was vacated when Jerry Connolly was elected to Congress. Well, I met Jerry uh, at the uh, Council of Governments, and then I, I certainly had the opportunity to work with you down there, and uh, it's a great way for our region uh, to work together. I'm just in my 10th year on the County Council, in my third term, so I've got a lot to learn from you. <laughs> I know. Uh, sometimes I feel like an accidental politician. You know, I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going into politics. How about you? How'd you get involved? Me too. That was, <laughs> <laughs> and actually I use the exact same description sometimes as, uh, as being an accidental chairman, uh, an accidental supervisor before that. And, uh, and I came up through neighborhood association uh, paths. You know, I was the Civic Association president in Kings Park West, my neighborhood, when George Mason University was uh, planning the Patriot Center. Aha! Uh -huh. And Braddock Road was only two lanes wide. It hadn't been widened yet. And so our neighborhood was very concerned about that. And so we expressed opposition. Uh, we also expressed uh, the need to widen the road, which eventually it was. End of the story, Patriot Center has become a, a wonderful facility. Uh, but I sort of got my start in civic activism and that was a path that led me to running for office eventually. And then I uh, never chose to be chairman of the Board of Supervisors. I, uh, it was suggested by Jerry Connolly when he was running for Congress that I consider running for his seat. Yeah, well, that's great. So don't, don't you feel proud when you go by the uh, Patriot Center? I do. I had a role to play in that. You know, what happened to me, it's almost, this is showing my age, of course, um, almost 30 years ago to this day, I came home from the hospital with my second child. And um, uh, just a block away from me, someone made the mistake of demolishing a building that second day after I was home with a brand new baby. When you can imagine how annoyed I became by this. And I, I fell into politics that way, got involved in litigating a building, uh, the height of the building. In fact, uh, I still look at it and say, well, I sort of did a good job, not that great a job, and got the height reduced on a, on a building in my community in Silver Spring. And um, got me into planning and land use, and here we are making some progress, aren't we? We are, and I, you know, listening to you uh, <laughs> and, and knowing how similar our paths were coming into public office, I always describe myself as a wonk, and mm -hmm. I suspect you might, yeah. you might the same. You know, we, we're interested in, you know, what makes things work and sort of getting into the weeds, and uh, it's pretty fascinating stuff, and it's a, you know, um, career that I've, you know, been very happy in. Well, you know, local land use and planning has always been sort of the, sort of the religion of Montgomery County, mm -hmm. and um, that's certainly where I 
where I come from and where I still am. I chair the, the committee that, that deals with that on the county council. That's the, it, as in Montgomery County is set up a little different from Fairfax in terms of county executive and council, but that is something we spend a lot of time on and it defines the future of a community and it does. it's so important to people. I've had, I'm an attorney and I've had clients who are business people who are always railing against government regulations and the like. But if a building goes up next to them that they don't like, they immediately become uh, very concerned and, and want more regulation and more control. Do you see that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I guess I first um, met you and got to know you when I had first been appointed to the uh, COG, Council of Governments uh, Committee uh, regarding air quality. Mm -hmm. And so I, I remember my very first meeting, there was a big controversy. I don't even remember exactly what it was, but, uh, but you had worked out or were entrusted with bringing to the table uh, a way of resolving whatever it was. And so I remember that very first meeting and I, uh, I remember everyone telling me just follow Nancy Florine's <laughs> lead. <laughs> well, I don't remember what the controversy at the time was either. It was probably the ICC. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Have you come and driven our new road? I have not. I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. And of course, we have our new road under construction, the Hot Lane Project. So, uh, so I'd be interested in seeing how you know your, uh, you know your facility is working. Well, you know, whenever we go to Virginia, I look at all the transportation work that's going on right now, and I kind of say to myself, "Oh, we need that in Montgomery County. Uh, we need to address the Beltway in 270. Uh, we've got plans in place uh, to address a little bit of that, mm -hmm. uh, but but we're nowhere near where um, Virginia is. How did that?" Um, come to be put together so effectively? It may look easy <laughs> to see how everything is under construction right now, but leading up to it, there were, uh, there were many earlier iterations of how we were going to provide more capacity on the Beltway. And uh, in fact, it's been widened, I think, twice before in history. Um, but, but the current widening uh, originally, VDOT, the Virginia Department of Transportation, had a plan that sort of ate half the county in having to gobble up right-of-way. Yeah, that's and a transportation engineer for you. There you go. <laughs> but the private sector actually stepped for forward, and it was Floor Transurban uh, with a different design that took very few houses, uh, I think no commercial areas, and were able to work essentially within the footprint of the existing VDOT right-of-way. So um, the state was responsible for entering into a partnership with Floor Transurban, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we had never experienced a design-build road project before. Uh, that really means that, man, it may not be finished, you know, being designed, and they're ready to break ground. Uh, and then are working on design features as, as they proceed. Has there been, a, I, I haven't heard a lot of debate about that. Not a whole lot, and uh, people were skeptical and still are about whether or not uh, the hot lanes will, will work, yeah. and we'll see. Uh, it's, you know, congestion management, it is new capacity, and so people driving in the regular lanes, there, you know, there shouldn't be a change for them except that people who are in a hurry or if you're in a carpool or people who want to take an express bus will have a new lane to be able to drive in. And if you're a single driver in a, in a car, you can pay to get on to that, ah, to, the, uh, to the fast lane. Well, people are still a little resistant to the toll issue on the ICC. I think it's going to take a long time to, right. to settle in. But, you know, with the state of transportation funding the way it is, we have no other way, do we? It provides reve revenue. it provides revenue for transportation. Well, did you ever think when you started out with the Patriot Center issue that you'd end up uh, no being so knowledgeable about improving the Beltway and public-private partnerships it's and all these things? Fun. It really isn't has it been great. Fun. Yeah, uh, to have a hand in in the future. It really is. And you've got the purple, uh, the silver line. Yes, the, si uh, and along. the silver line is is also. I'm jealous of that. You know, <laughs> Montgomery County needs to link. To that line, yeah, uh, we need to get that into the uh, transportation plan. Absolutely, somehow. something along the Beltway. Something else uh, that we share is the uh, commuter rail system. We have the VRE, and in fact, that was one of the first things that I worked on when I was first elected to office. 
uh, was getting commuter trains on the existing freight train tracks that go through Virginia. And then you in Maryland have Mark. And while they don't connect, they all come together at uh, Union Station. And, uh, and so that was actually my precursor for getting involved in mass transit. And now, of course, it's the Silver Line. Well, it's a great thing. I'm not sure I would have ag I agree with you about where you're putting the, the train station at uh, uh, Dulles, but it um, was my decision to make, and I appreciate the cost issues. Yeah, this, you know, this, these are hard calls. The cost was significant to put the station underground, and originally it was under the, the uh, MWA wanted to put it under the terminal. Um, so that was just prohibitively expensive above ground opposite the terminal with an, a below ground enter, entryway is what finally was, was uh, decided upon. And uh, it'll, people will be out of the elements when they arrive at that station. They'll have a view of the terminal, which is, of course, very, very attractive. Activity a day and eating well can help get your child healthy. So keep them active and eating well every day. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. That's letsmove.gov. As this No Boundaries continues, Montgomery County Council Member Nancy Florine asks Fairfax County Supervisor Sharon Bulova about her prized possession. I understand you have the coolest picture ever in your office. Can you tell us about it? Yes, I, um, I do have a wonderful picture in my office. It is a picture of me, my dad, and my sister Mirmi. Uh, and in the picture, uh, we are looking through a window at President John F. Kennedy, actually before he was president, he was running for president. I guess I was about 12 years old. I was uh, a student uh, at Catholic school in Pikesville, Maryland, uh, and my family and I had, had heard, we were big Kennedy fans, and we had heard that John F. Kennedy was coming to the, uh, to the armory in Pikesville. And so we decided maybe if we drove up, we could have a chance to see him. So we drove the car to the Pikesville Armory, uh, watched his motorcade arrive. It was all very exciting. He got out of the car, went into a little building, uh, and we circled, we the crowd, circled the, the building, uh, found a window, looked, peeked in the window, and just as we were looking in the window, a door opened inside and he walked right into the room. He saw, you know, everyone gathered at the, at the uh, window. He came over and I remember this as though it were yesterday. He put his, his hand up on the screen and we all put our hand up as well and so we touched his hand to the screen. How cool. It was, was terrific. It was yeah. probably uh, among the most exciting uh, days of my life. Then about a week later, week or two later, it was in Life magazine, the, oh, same, the same photograph. How cool. So I, I uh, searched old bookstores <laughs> for the longest time to try to find, uh, try to find the picture and, uh, and then had it framed and I put it in my office. It's one of my cherished possessions. Well, and that's why us politicians always want a picture of a child. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so you made history with that. So your family was was always interested in in uh, politics. In politics, yeah, actually. Family um, tradition. My dad was a Republican. My mom was a uh, Democrat, and so I was always treated to these arguments. <laughs> and one of my early memories was the Eisenhower and Stevenson election. I was just a little kid, but I remember my mother went out, knocked on doors, and canvassed. My dad didn't do anything except opine, and uh, and his candidate won. And I always thought that's so not fair because <laughs> she really? worked harder. Uh, well, you have big advantage for me. My folks uh, were diehard Republicans. In fact, most of my family are all Republicans, and they think I'm 
a lunatic, being a, a Democrat and a, a, certainly involved in Montgomery County politics. Uh, but uh, that was never part of my, uh, my family experience. Although I will say I have a cousin who was a member of the school board and another mm -hmm. cousin who got, was elected uh, to the state legislature in Connecticut. So there must have been something going on. Interesting. But we didn't knock on doors where I came from. Uh, and, but you have a son who's uh, yes, taken actually, up this a, as well. It went into the family business. When I was elected uh, to the Board of Supervisors, and, if, and I've you know, served for 24 years, uh, my son David, uh, when he, I guess it was when I first ran for office, David went off to college, came back during, during the summer, and worked on uh, the Belial's campaign. And that sort of hooked David. He got so into it. he was interested, you know, from a point of view of watching me in politics. And then he was really so did, interested. So did he go campaign with you? Did uh, your he kids he do campaigned that? with me, helped out on my campaign. My so did my daughter. They knocked on doors with me. Now you have four children. I have children? two children. Two children. Two children are mine. Two children uh, from my husband's uh, first marriage. Uh, okay, and, and so then you we have, have five grandchildren oh, all together. <laughs> But, uh, but, so Dave, but David went into politics. So, so the kids were engaged in your campaign all the time. They were. They they were. Uh, they they enjoyed it and uh, you know played a role. They, they as far as I could see, there never was resentment. It was more that they were actually excited about about you know the the campaigns. They were excited about you know being able to knock on doors with me. And actually the same thing happens with David and his family. Oh, that's David nice. is in the General Assembly and he just came off uh, of a campaign running for re-election uh, and his kids campaign with him. So does his wife Gretchen. Uh, and he goes to political events and everybody knows the kids as well as they know David. That's terrific. My kids were less than fully enthusiastic uh, when I first got involved, but uh, my son and daughter have helped out over the years, that's for sure. And my, my husband's, the, at this point, good with the signs. We have to put up a lot of campaign signs. Right. That's sort of his delegated task. But how have you managed uh, um, your political life and your community life and having a, an active family? You know, it's not easy. No. It is not easy. And uh, trying to balance between, you know, family responsibilities and the time that you want to spend with your husband, with your children, with your extended family. I'm the oldest daughter of four children. And, uh, and then devote the time that you need to devote in your political life is not, is not easy. And then, of course, carving out time for your own self. But, but it's a balance that I've, I think I've been able to strike for the most part, uh, and something that keeps me sane is uh, is jogging, and I, I try to start my morning uh, by going out and taking a run. I'm slow. Good I'm for a you. Good I'm for not you. A very How good far runner, do you but go? I'm faithful. Two miles. That's that's Two excellent. Yeah. That's excellent. Uh, it's it is a challenge. We pretty much have a have a sacred Friday night. That's nothing. That I don't go to things then. That's a t time to be home with my husband and. Um, I d I've been working on my yoga oh, and my, my bike riding skills, so oh. it's a, it, that's something that I do to keep to clear my mind, and it's it, it, the exercise I think really helps. Absolutely. Yeah, but you got to be be religious about it, don't you? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> Although it, probably the same with the yoga with you, the running for me, it it becomes part of. Um, I think your body craves it if uh, if yes. you if you let it go. And, uh, but it's just good. It clears your head, gives you time to think and contemplate, and uh, you know that's valuable time. And I actually, uh, like you, Friday night is date night, yeah. and so that's <laughs> my night with, with Lou. And, uh, and then we also try to keep uh, uh, Sunday nights uh, is pizza night. <laughs> pizza and movies on Lou's big screen TV in his man cave. <laughs> I yes. am invited down uh, for that uh, for that evening. Well, that and that is a privilege, I'm sure, and a great great escape. Well, as your kids have grown, you've seen a lot of changes as well in in Fairfax, and certainly we have in Montgomery County. Um, what do you think have been the biggest um, uh, uh, biggest evolution of, of of community or ideas or That's, efforts? That is such a good question. When I, when I was first elected and when I was a, was a young adult, uh, I was elected on a slow growth platform. 
um, to try to slow things down, stop growth for a few years so we could catch up with everything. And of course, you know, in retrospect, that was a sort of naive. We don't know? think of Fairfax as having a slow <laughs> no. growth perspective. <laughs> well, and obviously <laughs> it didn't happen. Uh, but, uh, but what I see now and what I've learned over the years is it's not that you grow, it's how you grow. And so I would say that that's the biggest evolution. Our, uh, our, our efforts to transform Tyson's uh, and also to orient growth around metro centers and you know make a more uh, a more more urban more compact development pattern going into our future is is really how we've changed mm -hmm. I'm a believer in that and well you know yeah you know Montgomery County has always considered itself sort of a slow growth mm -hmm. uh, community it's been a lot of time preserving its agricultural reserve we've right. got about 93,000 acres uh, committed to that and now we're focusing on what's left over. Mm -hmm. and, and it's an interesting challenge because you're dealing with things that are next to people who mm -hmm. are here already. Right. And it's, so it's not new things. It's redeveloping existing edges and, and communities and things like that. And it's very interesting. We're really big into design now mm -hmm. and uh, how you create, sort of recreate some of the benefits of, of older communities and adjusting those uh, objectives to new expectations of what you need to be able to support your tax base. The um, protecting your older stable neighborhoods while at the same time orienting your growth toward areas that you want to redevelop where you want revitalization is where we are. So um, you're, you're right, it's, it's, the future is definitely different, Our, the development patterns are going to be different than what they've been in the past in Fairfax County. During their conversation at the Irish Inn in Glen Echo, Nancy Florine and Sharon Bulova discover they have much in common, except their preference for pets. I'm a dog person, but I hear that you're a cat person. I have a big orange cat <laughs> that uh, is the love of our life right now. His name is Frodo, and uh, he's part Maine Coon and part American Bobtail because he has a short tail. Sounds either, scary. Either that or something happened to his tail and they passed him <laughs> off as, uh, as an American bobtail. <laughs> so Frodo, that, that sings to me of... Uh, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, I he remember, remember fuzzy, hearing fuzzy, about... Fuzzy paws. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have Lady, and um, Lady was a replacement for Tramp, who oh. met an untimely end, I think, a death by Toyota as we would say, he got loose and out he went and it was all his fault, but we're uh, dedicated to um, the pets out of Lady and the Tramp. Uh, but we need these things to, yes, to keep us sane and uh, certainly my walks with Lady uh, keep me in touch with the neighborhood and uh, what's going on there. Uh, so what do you see uh, for the future of Fairfax? As a, a slow growth person, here you are championing the biggest uh, development in the region, uh, redevelopment in uh, Tyson's Corner. And I will say, while people don't think about this as me, um, 
my my start as taking down the building uh, mm -hmm. targeted me as a civic activist representing all the NIMBYs in the community, which I did for quite mm -hmm. some time. So we've both evolved, haven't and we? And I started <laughs> with you know with uh, leading the charge you know against the Patriot Center at George Mason University, uh, and uh, and here I am uh, a champion for for the transformation of Tyson's and also for redevelopment around uh, metro centers and around our older commercial areas but I, I have actually a story um, about how I got there and it was when I was the Braddock District Supervisor. Braddock District is in the middle of Fairfax County. It's very much a residential uh, district, very little commercial uh, and I remember some neighbors who I worked with all the time uh, it, who lived in I think it was Ravensworth Farm and they came up to a uh, to chat with me at the end of a meeting and they said Sharon we're we're going to be moving out of uh, Fairfax County we're retiring and I said oh I'm so sorry to hear that um, and I imagined that they were going to tell me that they were moving to maybe South Carolina or Florida or someplace uh, where they would spend their retirement years and I said well where will you be moving and they said Arlington, Boston and I said, Ooh. <laughs> I said <clears throat> really why um, why are you moving to Boston and they said well we want to be someplace where mm -hmm. we can walk out of our door and go to shops and go to restaurants and where things are happening without having to get into our car and drive. And I realized that we actually don't have that kind of lifestyle, at least not to very much of a degree in Fairfax County. We have Reston Town Center, uh, which offers some of that, but we really don't have the kind of lifestyle that is walkable, transit-oriented, uh, where things are pulled together for you, where you don't need to have a car. Yeah. And actually that kind of development pattern also helps to resolve some of the transportation challenges that we've dealt with, with you know, with past development patterns. Well, you are so right. You know, my three kids, they all live in urban environments mm -hmm. where they can walk to everything. Two of them don't have cars. Uh, they ride, but my daughter rides her bike to work on Capitol Hill every day, yep. which she didn't all of the time, but she does, and, and to graduate school at Georgetown. So I, I think the younger generation certainly wants that. And I'll tell you, I'm having a little bit of a battle with my husband, who'd be just as happy to live in a, in a condo in uh, Bethesda or in an urban environment where, for exactly those reasons, who wants a yard? The first home that I owned where my children grew up was in Kings Park West, quarter acre of a lot, and uh, you know, but you had to get into your car, driveway, go everywhere, <laughs> driveway, lots of leaves with you know, yeah. trees uh, all around. When my kids left to go to college, um, and I was left with the responsibility of raking, I decided I had raked my last leaf, moved into the house where I am right now, which is a very small lot. Uh, roomy house uh, close to the government center where I work uh, but the next home I own it might be in Tyson's Corner it mm -hmm. might be someplace where I give up my car entirely and I can uh, take the elevator down walk outside there are pocket parks I can get on Metro uh, drive into uh, take the Metro into Bethesda or to Washington DC or uh, or uh, go to a restaurant or a shop, you know, where everything is close to me and I don't have to drive. Well, that's, I think, uh, the thinking that uh, we're seeing in Montgomery County as well. So let's work together, see if we can get that metro connection directly over to the silver line from the red line and uh, make it easier for our residents to live and play in this terrific region, shall we? Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming, Thank you so Sharon. much, This Nancy. has been great. Let's do this some more. It's been fun.
Be sure to tune in to the next No Boundaries when Montgomery County Council Member Craig Rice sits down with Maryland's Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown at La Canela in Rockville Town Center. <laughs>